As we wrap up our study of the tabernacle, in this video we will examine how the pattern of the tabernacle in the wilderness establishes the fundamental pattern for subsequent physical temples. Now let's quickly review the pattern of the tabernacle. Remember in Exodus 25:40, the Bible says, see that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So the Bible indicates that the tabernacle, even though it was a real and physical and fundamental part of Israel in the wilderness, it is a pattern of other things. So what is it a pattern of? We have learned throughout this study by examining the individual articles in the temple that it is a pattern of the work of Christ. The work that he did provides the way for us to re-enter back into the presence of God. The tabernacle in the wilderness with its three parts can also be seen as a pattern of the human being with body, soul, and spirit. And remember, Peter talked about having to put off his tabernacle soon, and Paul talked about we are clothed in an earthly tabernacle, and we desire to be clothed with that house that is from above, from our heavenly temple. In the last video, we also saw how the tabernacle is quite a fractal in the fact that its description in Exodus is also laid out from beginning to end in major events in chronological order in the book of Exodus. Our focus in this video is to understand how this fundamental pattern of the tabernacle is perpetuated in the first, second, third, and fourth physical temples on the earth. This is also a pattern of the heavenly temple. Let's examine the first permanent temple, which was built by Solomon in the glory days of Israel. Now, King David, Solomon's father, received instructions in writing from heaven on how to build this temple. And King David painstakingly wrote down all of these plans and made provisions for his son Solomon to build the temple. Solomon ultimately built the temple 480 years after Israel entered into the promised land, and it took him seven years to build this temple. This temple perpetuates the pattern of the tabernacle with the three compartments and the same furniture and the same functions with the priesthood and the celebration of the feast days. However, it magnified everything. First of all, it was permanent. It was much larger than the tabernacle, and even some of the pieces of furniture were multiplied. For example, the altar was much larger. The altar of burnt offering in Solomon's temple was much larger. Instead of just one laver in the outer court, there were 10 lavers upon wheels. It's very interesting that you have these lavers holding the water upon wheels because in Ezekiel 10, we hear a description of God's chariot, which is above the firmament and below the firmament. We have the description of the cherubim and the wheels with the eyes. And I think there's definitely a, a resemblance there. But in addition to these 10 lavers, Solomon created the bronze sea. This great laver was enormous compared to the original laver that was in the wilderness. And we've talked before how the crystal sea in heaven, this magnificent, beautiful firmament before God's throne, is pictured in this brazen sea upon the 12 oxen facing in the four directions. Now Solomon's temple also had two pillars. You can see one of them in the diagram there. They were named Boaz and Joachim. Boaz means uh, strength, Joachim he establishes. So those two pillars, capped by ornate decorations, framed the entrance to the temple. Now, the temple also had two compartments, a holy place and a most holy place, in the same way that the tabernacle did. In the holy place, instead of one lampstand, there were 10 lampstands. Everything on the inside of this covered portion was ordained, was ornately decorated with gold. So you can imagine the beautiful light and the reflection of the gold in the holy place. The showbread table was there and also the altar of incense. 
progressing into the most holy place, which again was separated from the holy place with the veil, progressing through that veil, we still had the Ark of the Covenant, which would have been the original Ark of the Covenant that Moses put in the tabernacle. But in addition to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, Solomon built two great cherubim of olive wood, and he covered them with gold as well. These olive wood cherubim guarding the Ark of the Covenant remind me of the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand next to the Lord of all of the earth, the two witnesses or Joshua and Zerubbabel as we read about in the book of Zechariah. Now this temple was magnificent, beautiful, incredibly expensive, and it was the treasure and central focus of all of Israel. Now in the description box and here at the bottom of this slide, you can see a link to a video. I highly recommend this video. It is a, a beautiful rendition of comparing the tabernacle and Solomon's temple in 3D, and it's, it's very helpful. So I hope that you'll check that out. Now, though permanent, though beautiful and magnificent, because of Israel's idolatry, the first temple built by Solomon was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and his army. And this commences the 70-year exile of the southern kingdom of Judah into Babylon. But when they return after the 70 years prophesied by Jeremiah, their primary goal is to rebuild the temple. And this is known as the second temple. The second temple was built by Joshua and Zerubbabel. This information is given in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and the prophets that the other prophets that correspond with Ezra and Nehemiah. When the second temple was built, it did not compare in any sense or respect to Solomon's magnificent temple. In fact, when they finally finished the temple, some were rejoicing because they had rebuilt the temple, but others were lamenting and crying because they had seen the glory of the first temple. Now, this second temple was the temple that was standing during Jesus' day. However, Herod expanded it into a magnificent temple. So the humble second temple built by Joshua and Zerubbabel was by the time of Jesus walking the earth, a magnificent temple. You can see in the diagram there a comparison between Solomon's temple and Herod's temple. And again, it still maintained the fundamental pattern of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Unlike Solomon's temple, which housed the Ark of the Covenant and Mercy Seat in the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place, the second temple did not contain the Ark of the Covenant. It was lost sometime between the destruction of the first temple and the construction of the second temple. Many suspect that Jeremiah hid it. Some suspect that it is under the Temple Mount in a hidden chamber in Israel. Some suspect that it has been carried off to Egypt, but there's, there's very many theories. But the second temple did not contain the Ark of the Covenant, which is very fascinating. Now, like the first temple, the second temple was also destroyed, this time by the Roman Empire. Now, what you see on this slide is a picture of something called the Arch of Titus. This was erected in honor of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And within the under part of the Arch of Titus, you can see these reliefs that have been carved out in the stone of the Romans victoriously carrying, you can see the menorah, you can see the table of showbread. They're carrying the articles of the temple away from Jerusalem. So even this temple was destroyed. This occurred in 70 AD, 40 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. This begins the great diaspora, the exile of Israel, not just to Babylon for 70 years, but the exile of Israel to the ends of the earth for coming up around 2,000 years at, at this time. So this is commemorated in the Arch of Titus. There has not been a physical temple standing in Israel 
since this time. However, the New Testament teaches us that a spiritual temple is being built by Christ himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, Paul talks about how our works are either equated to wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. And every man is building on a foundation, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 17, Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? In the same way that the presence of God was enthroned above the cherubim on the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant, believers are now, because of the work of Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The moment that a person believes, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they are born again of the Spirit. Now, born again does not necessarily mean without sin because we are still living in, in flesh, in our sinful flesh. But one day we will put off this earthly tabernacle and put on the house that is heavenly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, Paul reiterates, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? In 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, Peter says, Ye as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, uh, God makes the promise to believers that he who overcomes, he will make a pillar in the temple of his God. Remember the two pillars in Solomon's temple. So believers who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit comprise a spiritual temple at this time. Again, there's no physical temple standing in Jerusalem, but there is a spiritual temple built by Christ. However, we do look to the future, the very near future, for the construction of a third physical temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Now, here's a picture of the third temple. Um, again, this is a doctored picture. This is, of course, not an actual picture, but you can imagine how the temple on the right could be constructed next to the Dome of the Rock, which was currently on the Temple Mount. And this would be consistent with Revelation uh, chapter 11, which says, measure the temple, but do not measure the outer court for it has been given to the Gentiles. So it is a potential possibility that the third physical temple will be built next to the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. That remains to be seen. We will wait and we will watch and we will see what happens. But just as Israel, after the Babylonian exile, came back into the land and their primary goal was to rebuild the temple, now that Israel has returned from the ends of the earth to Jerusalem, they have an ultimate goal of rebuilding the temple, and this will be the third physical temple. This will very likely be built by the two witnesses in the same way that Joshua and Zerubbabel, the two lampstands and the two olive trees as described in, in the book of Zechariah. The two witnesses are also called the two olive trees and the two lampstands. They will have an integral part in rebuilding that third temple. Understanding the humble tabernacle in the wilderness shows us that this third temple will have the same pattern that we have been studying um, throughout this semester. All of the plans have been in works for several years now. The Temple Institute in Jerusalem has not only blueprints for the Sanhedrin, but also the third temple. They have began training the priesthood and reconstructing many of the articles in the temple. In fact, you can see the golden menorah standing in a very public place in Jerusalem. It's, of course, surrounded by bulletproof glass, but that solid gold lampstand is ready to go for the third temple. It is so unbelievably important to have an understanding of not only the tabernacle, but how the temple is the central focus of Israel. The third temple is the center of many of the prophecies associated with the end times. And keeping our eyes and watching for this third temple is important because some of the timelines given in prophecy are associated with this third temple. The prophecy of the 70 weeks, the prophecy of the uh, 1260 days, the 1290 days, the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 14, 
all of those timelines center around the temple. So the fact that the articles, the blueprints, the intention, everything is ready to go to build the third temple shows you the hour that we are living in. If you would like to watch the video, I'll have the link there below in the description box of the third temple's um, graphic animation of what their plans for the third temple would look like. It's really amazing to look at because you can see um, the, the remnants of the glory of Solomon's temple and how it has been modernized into a third physical temple. It is absolutely magnificent. Now, as I've been studying prophecy, um, and maybe as many of you have done, as you study prophecy, you learn more and your opinions about certain things and your understanding grows and changes. I remember being very opposed to the third temple because Jesus it, Jesus came, he was the ultimate sacrifice, and there is no further sacrifice necessary for the remission of sins. He came and once for all provided the way back to the presence of God. So why do we need a third temple? Well, in Israel, just as we have learned about how the tabernacle foreshadows the work of Christ and teaches us about who Christ is, the third temple will do the same thing for Israel, who is blinded in part until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. They do not corporately see Jesus as the Messiah. But when the third temple is built and the two witnesses are there testifying of Jesus Christ, and even though the sacrifices have be re, have, will have been reinstituted, those sacrifices are not sufficient to cover sin and to provide salvation. Only Jesus can do that. But those sacrifices will be an object lesson for all of Israel to see and to learn about who Christ is, what he has done, and what is shortly going to come to pass. So the third temple for Israel will be a good thing. It is through the sacrifices reinstituted in that third temple that their eyes will be opened and they will understand who the Lamb of God truly was. But again, many of the timeline prophecies and the desecration of that third temple by the little horn or the king of the north or the Antichrist, according to many of his names, those timelines are centered around the temple. So we need to keep our eyes on Jerusalem. We need to watch for that third temple um, and understand that when the sacrifices are reinstituted, the clock ticks down to the second coming of Christ. Now, just as the tabernacle is a pattern of the physical temples standing on the earth at various points in history, it is also a shadow of the heavenly temple that is made without hands. We can walk through the tabernacle from east to west and identify all of the parts and associate them with the description of the heavenly temple in the book of Revelation. The gate in the tabernacle can be viewed as the door that's standing open in heaven in Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. The altar of burnt offering in Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 we hear about the martyrs crying out from under the altar for uh, the avenging of their blood and the martyrs have been killed by the harlot at, of Revelation 17 and 18. In the same way that the blood of the sacrifices of the tabernacle was poured under the altar of burnt offering. We see the martyrs under the altar in the heavenly uh, temple. The laver in the tabernacle reminds us or is a shadow of the great sea of glass before God's throne in Revelation 4, 6 and 15, 2. And the table of showbread, although it is not expressly mentioned in the book of Revelation, each of the loaves of the showbread, there was one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we do know that the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned and represented in that 144,000. And because of what they will accomplish during the end times, there's a great multitude tribulation saints that will be saved during that time as well. And Jesus promises to them, never again will they hunger. That's Revelation 7, 4 through 17. They will have feasted on the bread of life. The lampstand in the holy place of the tabernacle can be seen in the seven spirits blazing before God's throne or the seven churches, which are the seven lampstands in Revelation chapter one. The altar of incense is certainly identified in the heavenly temple in the book of Revelation. Much incense is described 
being offered in the heavenly temple in the book of Revelation. And specifically, the golden horns of the altar are referenced in uh, the book of Revelation. The golden altar is the altar of incense, which is distinct from the brazen altar. The veil which separated the holy place from the most holy place can be seen as the sky rolling back in Revelation 6.14, where the throne room is opened and those on earth can see the lamb and see the one on the throne. And finally, the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat in the most holy place of the tabernacle is a shadow of the very throne of God. Even the ark is mentioned in uh, the book of Revelation. So all of the elements of the humble tent, the mobile, the, um, the, the tent that they would set up and take down and move and carry with them, that very humble tent is a shadow of something magnificent and higher and probably even in a higher dimension than what we can imagine. So an understanding of the tabernacle not only helps us with understanding the physical temples that will be standing on the earth, but the true temple in the heavenlies that is made without hands. Now we've been talking about the third temple, but did you know that there's also a fourth temple described a fourth physical temple standing on the earth in the Bible. This is described in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48. Ezekiel's um, very potentially a millennial temple that will be built by Christ in his in his 1000 year millennial reign on the earth as he reigns the he rules the world from Jerusalem. Um, there will be a physical temple standing. It is vastly larger than, of course, the tabernacle or Solomon's temple or even Herod's temple. And even the geography described of Jerusalem is different in the book of Ezekiel. Um, some of the feast days are mentioned, some of them are not mentioned, but what we do know is that there will be animal sacrifices offered in this millennial temple. We understand that Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, and only by his blood can one be saved. However, these sacrifices will very likely be pointing back and teaching those that are living in the millennium about the work of Christ. And we can consider that to be the fourth and final physical temple that stands on the earth. So as our study of the tabernacle concludes, remember where we started. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, God instructs Moses, he says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the purpose of the tabernacle is to make right what went wrong in the garden with Adam and Eve and bring mankind back into the presence of God and allow God to be amongst his people, just like he was walking with Adam and Eve. This purpose that God may dwell among us is realized in Revelation chapter 21, verse three. It says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So in Exodus, God says, make me a humble tabernacle in the wilderness that I may dwell among you. But this is ultimately realized at Christ's first coming, he tabernacled among us. But in Revelation 21, 3, after all things have been made new, the dwelling of God is with men and he will walk among them, be their God, and they shall be his people. So how do we get there? Well, Jesus told us, he says, you know the way home. John chapter 14, verses one through four. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now in, in Solomon's temple, by the way, there were many little rooms around the temple. They were for storage and for the, the priests to work in and, and um, dwell in. And Jesus says, there's many mentions where I'm going. Um, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, ye may be also. So Jesus promises, I have gone away, but I'm coming back to get you and I'm going to take you with me. He's going to take his believers, his people to dwell with him. And 
John 14, 4 says, And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And we have learned from the tabernacle that Jesus is the door. He is the gate of the sheep. He is the Passover lamb. He is the ultimate sacrifice. He was the blood. He offered his own blood for the remission of sins. He is the one that cleanses us. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is our great intercessor. He was the veil that was torn as his body, his flesh was torn on the cross, and he opened the way back to the presence of God. And at the right hand of the one on the throne is Jesus himself. And the one on the throne is God. And Jesus is one with God. So Jesus has instructed us through the symbolism of the tabernacle, the steps, the way back to the Father. And it is only through the Son. So I hope that you have enjoyed this study. And again, I want to say that understanding the tabernacle is fundamental in understanding the temples, the physical temples on the earth, the shadow of the heavenly temple, but also specifically the prophecies that are associated with the end times. If we are literate in understanding these things, if we know our Bible, then we'll be able to recognize the signs of his coming and we won't be found unprepared. So thank you for listening. Um, hope you have a wonderful day.